As you know, we've been, we're starting a series on 1 John, or we're now into the third week of 1 John, and uh, I was able to listen to Phil's sermon last week on our wonderful website. Thank you very much, Andy. So that was great. So let me just give you a bit of a recap on where we've got to so far in 1 John. We started in chapter 1, which is always a good place to start, and we were reminded that John was um, explaining that he'd not only heard about Jesus, but he'd met Jesus, he'd seen him, he'd touched him, yeah, so there's all that, I wonder what you're looking at there, um, but, and, um, and also that not only that, but he now continued to have fellowship with the Father and with the Son, and that fellowship is open to you and to me. I encouraged Ken Lawson to listen to that particular sermon and he sent me an email this morning saying, I'm so jealous of John. Because John could see Jesus and he could hear him and he could touch him. And I can't. Yeah, do you ever feel like that? I thought I'd just share what another one of our fellowship is feeling about 1 John. But do you know, as you read 1 John and you hear John writing about it, certainly as I, as I read it, I, I, I got the impression that the seeing and the hearing and the touching that were their physical experience when Christ was around before he was ascended into heaven, was in some ways duller in his mind than the ongoing fellowship day by day with the Father and the Son by the Holy Spirit. You get the impression as he writes that that that's what it's about now. You know, it's based upon this historical fact, but the life of God welling up in him by the Spirit is his present experience. And so when I reply to Ken, I'll say... Something along those lines. Well, he may even listen to it on the tape. Poor chap, he's having to do lots of trucking on Sundays. So uh, that's why he's not able to be here very often. So that was looking at chapter one. And the last bit of chapter one was looking at the sort of the downward steps we sometimes go in, in terms of our sin. And we said that sin was a theological word because God tells us what sin is. We don't decide what sin is. And we said that it starts off by us hiding from others our failings, then it goes on to hiding from ourself, and then we end up doing the really daft thing of hiding from God, which of course you can't do. And then we said that John finishes that chapter by saying, but don't worry about all that, we've got the one who deals with our sin. So stop hiding and just bring it to him and he can deal with it. And that is Jesus Christ. Now I know a bit more about that than I do about Phil's, but chapter two of, um, that Phil preached on so helpfully last week He was looking at the fact that it's not just about knowing Jesus and it's not just about, sorry, let's get this right, otherwise he'll be shouting from the rooftops there. Um, What it means, it's, oh sorry, he helped us to grasp, I'll write it as I've got it here. He helped us to grasp what it means to know Jesus and to live in him. Not just to know about him, but to allow our relationship with Jesus to have a real impact in our lives. So if you were here last week, was that about? Am I talking the right thing here? Okay. And not one foot in and one foot out. And I love the idea of Noah trying to do that. It sounded great fun. Um, Although rather disastrous. But daily living in the light of Jesus. So that's chapter one and chapter two so far. So we come to chapter three. And we're going to start reading from verse 11. Perhaps you can turn to that. It's on page 1,227. This is the message you heard from the beginning. We should love one another. Do not be like Cain, who belonged to the evil one and murdered his brother. And why did he murder him? Because his actions were evil and his brothers were righteous. Do not be surprised, my brothers, if the world hates you. We know that we have passed from death to life because we love our brothers. Anyone who does not love remains in death. Anyone who hates his brother is a murderer, and you know that no murderer has eternal life in him. This is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers. If anyone has material possessions and sees his brother in need, but has no pity on him, how can the love of God be in him? Dear children, let us not love with words or tongue, but with actions and in truth. This then is how we know that we belong to the truth and how we set our hearts at rest in his presence whenever our hearts condemn us. For God is greater than our hearts and he knows everything. 
Dear friends, if our hearts do not condemn us, we have confidence before God and receive from him anything we ask because we obey his commands and do what pleases him. And this is the command, to believe in the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and to love one another as he commanded us. Those who obey his commands live in him and he in them. And this is how we know that he lives in us. We know it by the spirit he gave us. And that last verse, that's the first mention that John has in this epistle um, in terms of the work of the Holy Spirit. You'll remember that when we were looking at chapter 1, I spent a bit of time giving some background to this idea of Gnosticism that was around at the time of John's letter being written. Gnostics are those who are looking for an experience, who are, are looking to say they've been, you know, had some kind of feeling about God, but aren't really very interested about the historical details of Jesus' living, dying, and resurrection. And neither are they that interested in how they actually go about living a self-sacrificing life. So John is writing this letter very strongly to try to rebuff this heresy which was starting to infiltrate the church. And so what, what John is saying as we come to chapter 3, he's dealt in chapter 1 with saying, look, stop keeping the spiritual separate from the earthy. He's, he's done that by saying, look, Jesus in chapter 1 lived, he lived, we touched him, we saw him, we felt him. So he was a real person, not just some enlightenment, not just some kind of spiritual experience. He's a real person in real history. And now in chapter 3, John is going on to say, and because of that reality, it has an impact on how we live our lives today. In other words, don't say, oh, I've had this wonderful spiritual experience, but I hate my husband or hate my neighbor or hate, hate whoever, because that doesn't work in the Christian life. We have the two together, his love welling up in us to break through the hatred which so often holds our hearts. Now, I'm going to look at four different types of relating that I think are shown in these verses 11 to 24. And the first kind of relating is a pretty basic level of relating, and it's shown in verses 11 and 12, and this level of relating is known as murder. And not a very nice kind of relating, but that's what verses 11 and 12 are dealing with, murder. And John is keen to point out that there is a source of this murderous intent. Yes, Cain actually murdered his brother, but the source of this murderous intent comes from Satan, or the evil one, as described in our translations of the NIV. He comes to murder, to kill, and destroy all that God has made beautiful. And we're told in this passage that Cain's father, in terms of his heart actions, is Satan. So if you look at the actions of murder, that kind of um, source of those actions is the evil one. Do you, do you follow me? So this is the first kind of relating. And we've already told, I've already told you a little bit earlier in the service as to why Cain's offering was wrong. And then you sort of think, well, it's a bit harsh, isn't it? God rejecting his offering. Well, he could have very easily have dealt with that and just said, oh, so how exactly should I do the offering? Okay, here you go. But he doesn't. He puts his heels in. He becomes jealous of his brother who gave the fat portions, the rich offering to God. And he becomes jealous. And, and it's almost as if Abel represents a mirror on his evil actions and evil heart. The, a, Abel is doing the right thing before God, acting in faith towards God, being generous in the offering that is brought. And it shows the poverty of his own worship. Perhaps that there's no worship there at all, since he offered no faith, had offered in, with no faith being present. So what, what Cain does is he chooses not to repent, to turn away from what he did wrong and to offer a good offering. Instead, he tries to destroy the right offering, the right response to God, by destroying Abel himself. 
And as soon as he does that, he not only murders his brother, but shortly following that, his, uh, God says, so where is your brother? And he says, I don't know. He then lies to God. Murder and lying and destruction are the first kind of relating shown in John's letter in chapter 3. And I guess Jesus saw some of this at first hand, didn't he? The Pharisees, you see, were rather fearful and jealous of him. Fearful that he might end up being the religious leader and not them. And so they turned in frustration to murderous intent. And Jesus called them children of the devil. We see the pattern repeated. Cain's attitude represents the present world system. And the world hates Christ because as Christ is presented, a mirror is held up and it shows the fact that we are living sinful lives. And the world doesn't like to see that. And so rather than turn around and live a right life, instead we try to just destroy that beautiful life of Christ. And so we blaspheme his name and we pull him into the gutter. So a bit miserable that, sorry about that guys. But, um, that's the first level of relating, it's murder. We come on to verses 13 to 15 and we find hatred. <laughs> it's a really, really cheery little sermon this morning, isn't it? But that is what we see shown here. Let me just read it to you. Do not be surprised, my brothers, if the world hates you. We know that we have passed from death to life because we love our brothers. Anyone who does not, who does not remains in death. Anyone who hates his brother is a murderer, and you know that no murderer has eternal life in him. This is always a tough one, isn't it? It's, it's as bad in Jesus' economy to have hatred in your heart as to murder. Now, I'm sure for the neighbour that you have hatred for, they would probably appreciate you not murdering them. Do you, do you follow me? You know, for them, it's probably better. But what Jesus is saying is that hatred is the source for the action of murder. It's kind of logical, isn't it? You hate and then you follow it through with murder. I'm told of a story, I'm not sure this is true or not, but it's a great story. A visitor went to a zoo and commented to the zookeeper that it was such a shame that the lions were kept behind bars. After all, they looked just like their cat at home. <laughs> it's like, this couldn't be true, could it really? Anyway, let's carry on. The zookeeper replied... They may look like your cat, but they have murder in their heart. Good line, isn't it? They might look like your cat, but they have murder in their heart. And frankly, the reason why some people do not murder is because of the bars which restrict them. The threat of arrest or being put in prison. You may say to me, well, Malcolm, I don't think you're right. Just take one look at countries with ethnic cleansing going on. Once the bars are taken away, if there's hatred in the heart, murder will follow. Do you see? So this is why Jesus was so concerned about whether hatred is in your or my heart. Paul, of course, hated Christians, didn't he? Do you remember? when he was called Saul before he met the Lord on the road, he hated Christians and he, he was instrumental in many of them being killed, murdered, if you like. He himself was involved in the stoning of Stephen. Yet he had an encounter with Jesus and after that encounter, everything changed. So some of us here this morning, we may say, well, actually I've got a bit of hatred in my heart, a bit of murder in my heart. Well, the fact is we need to turn away from that, as, as Paul did, have an encounter with Christ and to allow him to renew our hearts, to give us a heart of flesh. Because the Bible is not saying that no murderer can be a Christian, but certainly a Christian harboring murder in their hearts, this is not, this is not a happy marriage at all. And the antidote to hate is an encounter with love, isn't it? An encounter with Jesus, and I give thanks that hateful hearts can be opened to Jesus and they become loving hearts. 
I was speaking to somebody um, perhaps about six months ago now, and I was very, very sad. Um, this person um, had been seeking God to some extent, and uh, they, I, I sort of went to them and I said, how are things going? And they were saying to me that they just could not forgive a certain thing. It was just too big. And they had 20 good reasons why they wouldn't. Yeah? They had no intention. And they were holding that person in hatred, if you like. Do you follow me? Kind of thing. I'm not saying that some of us haven't been in this place. You know, we're, we're all sinners. But that was their situation. They had no intention of changing. They felt justified in their position. And what I shared with them is I said, I, I, I don't doubt that, that other person deserves everything that you want to throw at them. I don't doubt that. But I'm telling you now that there is no place before Jesus for those who will not forgive others. It's a tough one, isn't it? You're thinking, so not only they've given me grief, but now I've got a problem with my relationship with God. <laughs> it's just the way it is, friends. It's just the way it is. If we're struggling with hate of another person, we have to come to our Saviour and ask for our hearts to be renewed by his Spirit. We have to turn away from that, even though it may be fully justified in our minds. Um, Cranmer, who was very involved in setting up the Church of England and doing the prayer book and so on, somebody once said of him, and I would love this to be said of me, I'm, I don't think it can yet, maybe in 20 years' time it might be. Somebody said of him, oh, do you know, if you ever do a wrong to Cranmer, you're guaranteed to be loved by him for the rest of your life. You do a wrong to this saint of God and he will, in a determined way, love you continually for the rest of his life. Wow. This is the Christian path. There is no place for hatred for those who have had all their hatred taken by Christ on the cross. So we move on. It's getting better now, slightly better. Verse 17 if anyone has material possessions and sees his brother in need but has no pity on him, how can the love of God be in him? So we've had murder, hatred, we're now at indifference, okay? And do you feel you're making progress? <laughs> Come from murder, hatred, we're now at least indifferent. You know? <laughs> Sometimes when I talk to people, they'll say things like this, I've never ever deliberately hurt anybody. I, I'm quite a good person, really. Have you heard that ever? I've never hurt anybody. Wouldn't hurt a fly. Well, unless there's too many in the house. Yeah. And Jesus has a lot to say about this rather respectable middle class position. Many people who say this would have Jesus saying to them, in as much as you didn't do these things to the least of these, you didn't do them to me. So when we see a brother in need and do nothing, we've done nothing to Jesus. You left me in the cold, he'll say. I was in prison and you didn't visit me. I was hungry and you didn't give me a meal. Our passage shows a stark contrast between Cain on the one hand, who takes life, and Jesus, who through dying gives life. And I guess a question for all of us is, this indifferent position isn't the position for a Christian who knows Jesus. The question is, are we a life taker or are we a life giver? Well, there's no real, Jesus doesn't sort of say here and John doesn't suggest that just go for kind of neuter, go for the middle ground of doing nothing. In fact, what John says is there's no love in doing nothing. Just sitting there and getting fat, he says. So, what does this mean for you and for me? You may, sometimes people say to me, Malcolm, I haven't seen so-and-so at church recently. Have, you done, have anybody done this? Oh, I wonder, I wonder how they are. Do you know how they are, Malcolm? And of course, you know, it's good for the minister to know how people are and so on. But can I suggest, if you have that question in your mind, oh, I haven't seen so-and-so, how naughty of them not to be here? Do you know the kind of thing, you know, that kind of burden upon them? How about phoning them up or going around and saying, 
I've so missed you. The love of God, I don't say exactly these words, but the love of God is in my heart. I love you and I've missed seeing you. How can I help you? Yeah? Wouldn't that be great? Or just go around and say, how are you doing? Do something un-British. You know, turn up on the doorstep. Have some flowers in your hands, if it's appropriate. Indifference is not the place for Christians, is it? Do you know, for some people who, who haven't been here for various reasons, it's because they can't get here. They need a lift. That's the, real, that's the reason. And we as a church need to think about that, don't we? Oh, we'll have to get up a bit earlier then. Pick them up. That'd be a real pain. Really tie me down, that. <laughs> Where's the love of God amongst us? See the kind of idea? Yeah. Oh, there's lots of things. You just, just use your imagination. Allow the Holy Spirit to give ima- your imagination that we might perfectly love one another as he has loved us. Which brings us on to the... So we've come from the sort of the pits and we've, we're slowly coming up and we're, I think we're getting to the mountain now. This is, this is a lovely part of the passage, I think, which comes in at verses 18 to 24, which is the section on Christian love. So avoid all that other stuff and this is what we are about I've noticed that people tend to have something called an inbuilt sincerity testing system. When somebody says to you, oh, God bless, and oh, yes, lots of love, we kind of watch then and carefully scrutinise whether this is real or not. Does anybody else do this? Perhaps I'm just a hard little soul. But, you know, there's a sense in us that we kind of can tell whether it's words or whether it's words and deeds. And the truth is that Jesus walked the talk, didn't he? And so must we, if we are to follow in his footsteps. Friends, uh, various people get very excited. They say, oh, there's lots of people at church today. Oh, I think there's going to be more people at church. I love love it when there's lots of people worshipping God, don't you? It's great. It encourages us, doesn't it? Shall I tell you how you could double the number of people in this church? This is not some... Management speak, I don't say it knowing exactly what the percentage would be. There's a story, I'll tell you the story and then I'll tell you it's fairly obvious the reason why. Somebody once, um, I think it was D.L. Moody, met a, a little girl who was, who'd walked five miles to church. Not many people do that today, do they? She walked five miles to church and uh, D.L. Moody said to her, why on earth did you work five miles to church? You passed various churches on the way, why didn't you go to them? He said, oh, but they love you at that church. They love you at that church. You want to see this church double its size? Go and love it. Some people don't, actually. Oh, I think it may get a bit too busy. Something very personal about it at the moment. I do understand that. But goodness, don't we want to see the love of God shed abroad? Don't we? Do you? Others might know the love of God and to then pour out, not just in words, but in deeds, the life of Christ in this community. There are a lot of lonely people in our community. A lot of lonely people. Sometimes in families, sometimes living on their own. Very, very lonely. Do you know they'd be bowled over by the love of God if they really knew it? And they'll only know it if they see it in the lives of God's people. Well, the passage, I've I've overstepped my time, as is often the case, but the passage in this section, verses 18 to 24, tells us all sorts of fruit that will come as we enter into true Christian love. Let me give you a few pointers. Those who give substantially, give of themselves in money and time and energy, We're told in Luke 6, 38, it says, Give and it will be given to you, pressed down and running over. Sometimes people say, well, if I'm not sure I've got the resources to do that giving, whatever it might be. I'm not sure I've got the time. I'm not sure I've got the money. I'm not sure I've got the energy. Something, when we give out of love, there's an, well, God is love and his life is, As we do that, as we do the giving, if we're inspired by his love, 
there's a way in which, as we give, it doesn't sort of run out. Do you, do you follow me? I remember when we had, I've said this before, but when we had Sarah, um, Robert, I never thought I could love Sarah. And we had Sarah, I never thought I could have enough love for another child, Michael. And those of you who've got children, I'm sure you'll have the same kind of experience. Sometimes you don't have the love for them, do you? But anyway, that's a separate point. But, but what amazes me is, as we learn to love, love is not... It doesn't, it's not like other resources. When you spend it, more comes. Yeah? So this life of love, of giving away, is an easy yoke. I'm not saying it's easy. I'm just saying it's an easy yoke compared with the fear and hatred which are the alternative. These are heavy yokes to carry. His yoke is easy. Verses 19 and 20, let me just read those to you. This is then how we know that we belong to the truth and how we set our hearts at rest in his presence. Whenever our hearts condemn us, for God is greater than our hearts and he knows everything. So when we walk in this way of love, there is nothing to condemn us. Nothing at all. We walk in confidence. We hold our head held high. This is the beautiful freedom of the children of God. Stuart was speaking at coffee break this week. And if you notice how he's always got a bit of a smile on his face, that lad, Stuart. And uh, one thing which I always think of when I see Stuart is that beautiful line that, you know, some, he's, a, he's one of the happiest people I know. He just has the love of God in his heart and happiness overflowing. This is the portion which I would long for me and for all of us that we might live this life of love. And then notice verses 21 and 22. Dear friends, if our hearts do not condemn us, we have confidence before God and receive from him anything we ask. You want to have confidence in prayer. You want to see your prayers answered before God. Well, have your heart filled with love. Be living a life of love for those you, with those you meet. And you'll start praying aright, because you'll be praying in love for others, not primarily for yourself, and you will see your prayers answered. This is wonderful. And then, oh, we could go on, there's so many things to say. Just perhaps to summarise. The two sides of the coin. We said that what we are absolutely clear about within John's Gospel is all of what he is saying is based upon a real faith in a real man, Christ Jesus. And those who have this faith, who have made him their saviour and lord, inevitably the other side of the coin will be a life lived in love for others. Remember, Anne, love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, with all your mind, and love your neighbour as yourself. This is what John is speaking of in this letter. And if you want to see it summed up in one verse in this letter, then go to verse 23. And this is his command, to believe in the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and to love one another as he commanded us. Friends, please don't any of you go out this morning thinking, I'm going to love loads of people. I'm just going to love loads of people. That's it. I'm just going to love loads of people. I feel a bit guilty now and I'm going to love loads of people. That is not the message which John is bringing. Please hear this. He says... Behold what manner of love the Father has shown in his Son. And first, believe in Jesus. Put your whole self, not one foot in, one foot out. Put your whole self in Christ. And then, ask of his Holy Spirit that he might fill you. And then go and live a life of love. That's the inevitable, inevitable outworking. Do you follow me? Do not go, right, well I've got a number of things I've got which I don't like about other people, but I'll try to love them. I'm going to go and love them now. And you'll start to love them, and they won't be very lovely, and you'll get very disillusioned and say, it all doesn't work. Unless you know the love of the Father revealed in Christ in your life, you can't love. You can't love. Or if say it's very difficult to love, certainly it's impossible to love those who are unlovely. Shall we ask him to help us in this? Let's pray, shall we? Father, forgive me, forgive us for the murder and hatred that sometimes we find in our hearts.
forgive us and heal us. Forgive us, Father, for the indifference that we sometimes have, where we think it's okay to do nothing. Forgive us for this. But help us to come back to the cross and to all of what Christ has done and to be bowled over by divine love. To be bowled over that you would forgive us, knowing all about us. To know that your perfect love would cast out all those fears and hatreds that sometimes cling to us. Oh, we want you as our father, not the evil one. We want you to be our king, not Satan. We want, Lord Jesus Christ, for you to be exalted in our lives and in this place. We want to turn away from a life where we're just looking after ourselves and to even start walking that path of self-sacrifice. Show us, Lord, how we can give generously, financially, to others, to those in need, to those at the moment with massive debt. Show us, Lord, how we can carve out time to give to other people. And Lord, show us and help us to learn to truly love our neighbour with the love of Christ. Lord, as we even pray these prayers, we come depending upon you. Pour out your spirit upon us. Holy Spirit of God, equip your church to do the works of Jesus in these days. For the glory of his name. Amen.